Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Soul of Business with Blaine Bartlett. I am your host, Blaine Bartlett. And folks, we got something pretty special today for you. Um, I had a conversation with this fellow. Uh, I was introduced by a mutual friend. And the conversation that I had with him subsequent to that introduction just blew my socks off. I, I mean, I, I, I felt like I was talking to somebody that I had known forever, and we just picked the conversation up and ran with it. Um, and he started off with um, marlin fishing, <laughs> and, uh, uh, which I thought was a very interesting opening, but um, <laughs> it, it opened the door to all kinds of possibilities. And I, and I mentioned that because both he and I kind of work with the fact that there is, there is no accident. I mean, you know, synchronicity is a real thing and it's, and it's something that's palpable. It's something that can be leveraged. There are no un usable circumstances or unusable, unusable occurrences that happen in life. Everything is there for a reason and for a purpose. Um, Chris Doris is a quote unquote mental toughness coach. And, and basically he's in the business of uh, success coaching. Um, he's uh, actually you know, internationally famous for the work he does. He's worked with Super Bowl athletes, uh, professional teams, uh, high school teams, college teams. Uh, so, yeah, some of them, you know, some of them, and we'll get into some names here, but you know, some of the most successful businesses on the planet today. Um, and it's all organized around how do I step my mind up in a way that allows me to have the success that I dream of, you know, quite frankly, and I'll just kind of put it in those terms. Those are my terms. That's my language for it. Uh, Chris is going to have his own language for it, but Chris, I want to just welcome you to the show. I'm very interested in uh, just kind of where we're going to go with this. Yeah, Blaine, I appreciate that a lot. That's, uh, thank you for that intro, and thanks for that conversation that you're referring to. I feel the same way. It was very cool. Obviously, kindred spirits, and obviously, we both also got the memo on uh, having gray goatees and black tops on for our conversation today. <laughs> yeah, we, you got the memo. <laughs> Um, I want to go back in time here just a little bit into how you got started in this, because it was uh, you know, not what most people might think of as a traditional way to get in the position you are to work with the folks with whom you work. Yeah. So, yeah, and, I, and I think that you, you initially would include yourself in that, <laughs> in that description, because you didn't see yourself ending up in this place at one point in time. It's kind of like, how did I get here? Yeah. So yeah, give me eight bars on that. Okay. So after I graduated from college in 1990, the only clarity that I had with respect to the vocation that I wanted to create, and I used the word vocation very mindfully there uh, because I didn't want a job. I never wanted to have a job. I wanted a vocation. The only clarity that I had around that plane was that it was going to involve serving people. It's very vague, but, the, but, there, but that's some clarity. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the specifics on that. And I ended up taking a job as a clinical social worker because I was qualified to do that at the time, working on the streets of Atlantic City with homeless people, drug addicts, and chronic schizophrenics. It's hard work, paid nothing. Uh, you know what my, my starting salary was? Annual salary, $17,500 a year. I, when I say that, I'm like, I'm going to choke. Like, how do I live on that? But that's such hard work with so little financial reward, but it was a perfect, perfect, perfect foundation for the rest. <clears throat> so, but the, to, to really get the short version of your, your, uh, the response to your question is there's a through line. Like if somebody asks me, and my friends refer to me as CD. So they go, yeah, you know, they said, yo, CD, what's, uh, what's the most, what's the, one of the best decisions you've ever made in your life? And I said, maybe the best decision I've ever made in my life was to stay with my passion to stay with it and to trust the organizing intelligence inherent within my passion. Yeah. To trust the organizing intelligence. And I'll tell you what, because of all the really weak, weak money, faulty limiting beliefs that I picked up along the way that took residence in my mind for a long time, it took me a long time and there was a lot of opportunity to demonstrate uh, patience and, and trust, to keep trusting, trusting. <clears throat> My limiting beliefs about money uh, slowed down the process with which it took, or the time amount that it took for me to create wealth. But, but that's, that's a separate subject. 
the answer to your question is I stayed with it. I stayed with it. So it was social work. While I'm doing serendipity, serendipity. You, you mentioned synchronicity, serendipity, yeah. right? It's, everything is interconnected. Learn that from studying Carl Jung, who's my favorite of all the psychologists who's technically a psychiatrist, but who's real more like a philosopher and just a healer. <clears throat> but uh, as synchronicity would have it, I was playing hoops. I was a basketball player all my life. I was playing uh, pickup games at nighttime when I was doing social work at the Jersey Shore. And I went out one night, November 20th, 1991, shattered my leg. It was, a, it was like a horrible, it was a Joe Theismann. Compound fracture, bone out, bone out of the skin. I'm looking at it. It's just like bending the wrong, it's like, whoa. So after that, after I recovered from that, I said, that's enough hoops. I hung up my Chuck Taylors and I got out some golf clubs and started to, and I put all my passion into that game. Now, the reason that's significant is because I rapidly discovered how mental that damn game is. <clears throat> and I thought this could be my ticket. I'm going to marry my passion for uh, psychology, human potential, the human spirit, soul, with my passion for sport. So I decided to become a sports psychologist. So that's, that's how I ended up deciding to be a sports psychologist. Okay, so now I'm, I move out to Arizona, get my master's degree, and I'm starting my practice in sports psych. And w one of the things I'm doing is I'm, I'm doing mental toughness clinics for junior golfers out here at, at Arizona State University. And I invite parents to come for free. That was the decision, this critical decision, by the way, <clears throat> that changed my life because it was driven by the desire to bring more value to these workshops, to invite parents to attend for free if they pay for a child. Life-altering decision, by the way, right there, because one of the parents who came, Dave Canham, he's, he brought his son, Evan. I'm still super close with them. Still, This is like 20 years ago. <clears throat> he loved it. The dad, Dave, comes up to me afterwards and he says, this was amazing. I run sales for a company out here called Insight. So I, I know Insight. Insight sponsors one of the you know, football, the, the ball games. He goes, yeah, yeah, well, I do sales for them. And you know what? We need you. I said, all right. So that opened up the world. You know, uh, so then I go into the, I was actually, to be honest with you, Blaine, I was nervous about that. I had weird yeah. thoughts about like the corporate world being a, a, a foreign entity that I'm not familiar with. Like I didn't think I owned a tie when I thought I needed a tie. You know, like I was a social worker, man. I, I don't know what, like what do they even talk? But I have the uniform. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like in my call, all of that stuff. But anyway, I did it and, it and it went amazing. And then, you know, fast forward, like the, Dave and I stayed in touch. He invited me to start doing keynotes. Keynote, I didn't know what a keynote was. And I'm doing a closing keynote because he invited me. I'm just all I, I'm just staying with the work, sharpening my saw. That's it. Just staying with the work, sharpening my saw all the way through. Boom. And it opened up. <clears throat> now I'm you know, writing books on mental toughness and doing keynotes, but I'm coaching these huge sales teams and huge multi-billion dollar companies around the planet. And you're right. I didn't see it coming, but, but you know what? In a way I really did. Yeah. Because, because I'm still at the core. That's, you know, Maya Angelou, I, I can't, you know, I, again, I'm going to go back to this whole synchronicity, serendipity thing. Um, I got something, you know, you know, in one of my early morning news feeds, um, and I, and you, you've got your daily dose uh, that I want to make sure that, you know, we get people to sign up for. Um, but this came across today in, in, in uh, the Optimist Daily, which is another newsletter that I kind of work with. Uh, Maya Angelou, you can only become accomplished at something you love. Don't make money your goal. Instead, pursue the things you love doing and do them so well that people can't take their eyes off of you. That's beautiful. I love that. And, and doing what I'm, I'm becoming accomplished at what I love. That, yeah, the form is irrelevant. It's the, the core that I actually organize around. And that's what you've done. Yeah. And you know, right. when we start looking at success in life and, and mindset, you know, doing the do, do what it takes. Just do what it takes. There's Keep a mindset around going. that. Be all in. And that that notion of being all in around what you love. I mean, you know, you, you start bringing that to the table and you know, life changes in a very interesting way. 
So I, I'm curious, Chris. Yeah, you know, how do, you know, CD? How, how do you uh, how do you define success? Yeah, this is very okay. So that's a big. I, I love that. My, my definition of success is having your life on your terms. Mm-hmm. Like I, I keep, and if anybody's got a, a, another suggestion, I'm all ears because I want to. I, I just, I love that question. I love the notion of success, but I love the, I love the phenomenon of. I'll, I'll just say success, like because most of us have been conditioned to believe that success. Well, hell, like uh, what's the book, Leo Tolstoy's The Death of Ivan Illich. <clears throat> Tolstoy's yeah. classic book, The Death of Ivan Illich. Ivan Illich is a is a guy who, you know, was conditioned like most of us to believe that success is defined by status and money. Yep. So he commits his entire life to the achievement of that. And I've coached a ton of people who've done the same thing. And then afterwards go, is that all there is? Like, well, where like where's the meaning? Um, you know, so <laughs> So my definition is having your life on your terms, whatever those terms are. So in order to be successful, we need to know what our terms are first. What is really important to me, which requires us to clear ourselves of what we've been taught to believe we should be doing with our lives. What we've taught, what we've been taught to believe would make us valuable and our lives meaningful. And trusting, as I said earlier, and this is a big deal, trusting the organizing intelligence inherent within our passions. And that Maya Angelou quote is beautiful. I asked you to send that to me later on, if you would. Um, You know, when I was right out of college, I I don't remember who told me to do this or where I came across it, but I still have. It's over my bookshelf. It's a a book called Do What You Love, The Money Will Follow by Dr. Marsha Sinatar. Sinatar, Thank God I read that. <clears throat> because that was like the last little thing. Because I had a lot of temptation, you know, um, to give in, to go get a good paying job, to use my good grades to go get a good paying job. Have your backup plan. Mm, yeah, you know, yeah. Well, you know, that whole idea of a backup plan suggests, you know, I've got a plan B. I've got, a, I've got an escape route here. Yeah, Cortez burned the boats. <laughs> yeah, we're burning, yeah. Like going back. That's all in, baby. That's all in. That's all in. Um, yeah, the, the idea for me is you know, success. I mean, Earl Nightingale talked about it as being the, uh, the worthy pursuit or, or the, the continual pursuit of a worthy ideal. Yeah, that, that's all well and good, a worthy ideal. Uh, but practicality you know, kind of shows up here. And where I've come to you know, define it is you know, success is uh, developing the, particularly sustainable success, developing the capacity to continuously start over. And that's one of the things that I think you are masterful at teaching people how to step into mm, mm. You know, developing that capacity. And it's a mindset, you know, you know, capacity. What do you mean by the capacity to do that? You know, because resilience is part of that connection to meaning is part of that. I mean, all of those sorts of things kind of come into that, that whole conversation around your mindset. Um, and I know that there's a question embedded in, the, in this <laughs> <laughs> in this little monologue that I'm into right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, let me, let me kind of dig through it here. Um, the, the, you know, when you're working with, um, you know, let's just say Super Bowl champions or pro athletes, these are guys that are incredibly high performers and are guys and gals. So I'm not just going to gender specific. You know, I mean, these are people that know what it means to really put themselves on the line. What's that little piece that separates that extraordinary pro athlete from one that is just exceptionally good? Let me, well, uh, the, uh, the short answer is belief. <clears throat> the short answer is, and it's not, has not, it's not just about athletics. This the question. We could just open it and say, what's the difference? What's the real difference between people who crush life and who don't? And when I say crush life, I mean create a life that is on their terms. Yeah. Right. And it's, they know what they want and then they believe they can have that. And a, com- a characteristic of them is what you mentioned earlier. And I wrote it down. You said it in the very beginning and I'm keeping this one. There are no unusable circumstances. I love that. I wrote that down. I'm going to keep that. Uh, there are no unusable circumstances. So I, I was coaching a woman. <clears throat> Her name is Hope Llewellyn. 
Google Hope Llewellyn, L-E-W and then Ellen. Uh, Hope was um, working at, I think, Chicago O'Hare back in the day uh, outside uh, the airport, and she was run over by a plane. <laughs> not, not hit by a truck. You heard it. You heard it. She was run over by a 747. Her leg was severed. Jesus. So uh, now uh, Hope has represented the United States in four different Paralympic sports. Yep. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. She has chosen to take a, a and I'm going to use air quotes here, an absolute tragedy and create I'm telling you about this uh i love hope so much she's actually a former guest on my podcast <clears throat> let me know if i'm frozen my computer is telling me that um i'm unstable <laughs> yeah you, you froze for just a little bit yeah. but uh, i'm not gonna and, and it isn't it beautiful like synchronicity here we are talking about there are no unusable circumstances just like this one. <laughs> so, but Hope you know, you know, chose to use. So Hope could have gotten frozen in time around that accident, but she didn't. Look at you go. Look at you go. Hey, I'm a trained professional. Don't try this at home. That is, <laughs> amen to that. Yeah, right. And, that, and now, so let's take that metaphor because it is, look at us. Look what we're doing. We're using it. It's Everything is connected, man. So, yeah, she, and most people are, are we are all conditioned over time to be victims of circumstance, to permit the outer world to govern the inner world, which then completely governs how we show up in life. So yeah, she could have been frozen in the victim role there. It would have been very easy for her to play a victim, but she chose instead to go create absurd amounts of magic and inspiration from a tragedy. Right. That's, you know, we're going to take a real quick break here. Uh, when we come back in, I want to pick up something that you said just a moment ago that I think is useful for business. And it has to do with not being at effect of the circumstances that we find ourselves embroiled in. So speaking with uh, Chris Doris, and we'll be right back, folks. I want to thank you for listening. Um, I want to also invite you right now to go to blainebartlett.com. And on that site, which is my personal website, you'll see uh, services up on the top menu. I'd like you to click on Leadership Mastermind. Now, why I want you to do that is we have uh, structured a mastermind program that is very unusual and it is very powerful. And by going on to that site and clicking that link, you'll be taken to a landing page that is an invitation to join this mastermind. It's a 52 week long exploration of what it takes to be a highly effective leader in today's fast changing environment. You won't regret it. And if you've been liking what you've been listening to on these Soul of Business podcasts, how does one become a leader that can keep connection to the soul of business. That's what we look at. That's what we're about in this mastermind program. So again, go to blainebartlett.com and click on the services link. And there you'll find the link to the leadership mastermind program. Look forward to seeing you there. Thanks for listening to this little commercial. And now back to our show. Welcome back. And before we took a break, Chris had mentioned something about not being captured by the circumstances that surround us in life. I mean, yeah, and, and he was uh, talking about uh, Holly uh, and having her leg severed and you know, the incredible things that she's done is, you know, by, by not being captured by the circumstances of being hit by a 747. I mean, literally, who gets hit by a 747? Yeah, I mean, run I would take that to the bank. Yeah, you know, some people will go, God, my life. Yeah, how do you? Yeah, yeah, you to ask her. Yeah, what's, what's, what's the best thing that's ever, what's the best thing, Hope? Hope, what's the best thing that, that uh, has ever happened in your world? I got run over by a 747. <laughs> yeah, I got run over by the best thing. Now, I'm, I'm sorry. Businesses, see, yeah, th th this whole notion of the, uh, the soul of business. And, and you asked me a great question. 
uh, right before we actually went live with this. And he said, how come there's no the in front of these, you know, the, the, you know, the podcast title, Solo Business? And I said, because, you know, solo is undifferentiated. Yeah, you know, I don't want to, you know, say there's only a certain you know, piece that has the soul. So, you know, forget the soul is everywhere. And why I'm you know, moving to this is this idea of competition has such toxicity attached to it. And, I, and I'm mentioning this very specifically in the context of uh, business, you know, in particular here, because businesses compete with you know, everybody in their market space and all that kind of stuff. Competition, as far as I can tell, is rooted in a context of scarcity. Scarcity is a consequence of being disconnected from source, mm. what I'm calling soul. Mm. Soul is mm. ever abundant. You cannot take, I mean, yeah, take a breath. Okay, well, take mm. another breath. Oh, don't take any more breaths because there's only a limited number of breaths. No, <laughs> you can't outbreathe the universe uh, mm. you know, while we're sitting here in this sphere. So when we're looking at circumstances that surround us as businesses, when we're looking at circumstances that surround us in our lives, and this is specifically in your wheelhouse here, how do you disabuse people of being captured by the circumstances and using the circumstances as a convenient out for not having the life that they want on their terms, the business that they want on their terms? Yeah, <clears throat> man, you just said a lot. So, okay. So uh, specifically with respect to that, that question right there, uh, let's, one, everyone get cool with the fact that we've all learned to be victims. It's part of the human experience. It's not a problem. There are no problems in the universe. The only place in the universe a problem exists is a neocortex of a human being where we are able to, to judge. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, I use a lot of mantras and um, a couple, several of them have come up as I listen to you. One is the problem is the gift. The other, of course, is every set of circumstances can be created from if viewed masterfully. But let, 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 let me tell you a short story about how sneaky the learning is that has us be victims of circumstance and then finish answering your question by saying how to unlearn that and return to our natural state, which is to be in the abundant mentality, experience all of reality as a field of infinite possibilities and go play with it. <clears throat> Little girl comes home from school and she's all smiles. And her mom sees her and goes, wow, honey, look at you. You're so happy. Well, that's great. What happened? Did you make a new friend at school today? And the little girl says, mm -mm. no, mommy, there weren't any new students today. And she goes, okay, so what is it? What, what, how, why are you so, you got cupcakes at recess. And the little girl says, mm -mm. We, we didn't have cupcakes today, mommy. And, and the mom, so she says, okay, well, why are you so happy? But what, oh, you got a sticker for your spelling quiz. The little girl says, we didn't have a spelling quiz today, mommy. All right, so let's, let's open this up here. This is a beautiful exchange. You know where I'm going with this too. The, this is a beautiful exchange, a beautiful loving exchange between this precious little girl and her hero of the cosmos, the most influential person in her world, her mommy. And embedded within this dialogue, this inquiry, is a disastrous lesson that the mother has no clue that she's teaching. And the little girl has no clue that she's learning. What is it? That my happiness is predicated on external circumstances. That couldn't be a more perfect answer. That was not rehearsed, everybody. That's how good that guy is. That is correct. <clears throat> yep. But there's no thing as causeless joy. In other words, what the girl's learning is that there has to be something outside of her in order to choose to occupy certain states like joy. Yeah. So what you know, that is, I, what she's learning, she's learning to be a victim. What, what, no, go ahead. Learning to be a victim, absolutely, yeah. And, yeah. And, and and it's pernicious. It's it's it's. I mean, we we start getting it right away. You know, I was I was not too far from you. I was I was up in Sedona uh, years ago, and I, you know, there's a little stream that runs through uh, the Red Rock there, and uh, Oak Creek. I was Oak Creek. It was exactly, and I was kind of sitting there with a couple of friends and saw this family come in little boy and little girl, uh, they couldn't have been much more than about four years old or something like that. 
And they set up a you know, little picnic area uh, back from the, uh, the creek itself. The little boy got up and, you know, wandered over the edge of the creek and was kind of looking at it. And daddy, you know, sitting back here on the blanket and going, Tommy, come, come, come away from there. You're going to fall in. And Tommy stopped and looked at his dad. Went, then he reached down and he picked up a little rock and he tossed it into the, the creek. Just, yeah, just toss it in. And daddy said, yeah, Tommy, I told you, yeah, step back away from there. You're going to fall in. This repeated itself about two more times. John, yeah, he'd look at his dad, pick up a rock, toss it back in, and you know, dad would say again. Finally, the little boy turned around, put his hands on his hips and said, daddy, that's your fear, not mine. Oh my God, that's so great. Bent down, picked go, up another rock and tossed it in. And oh to the dad's God, credit, I love so those. The dad's credit, he got up and went, you know, you're right. <laughs> and so he walked up and he started dad. tossing rocks into the water with the sun. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that... that, that that mindset that you know, you just so gets... we teach it right we learn it we learn it and and, and so, so there's this not a problem this is the human yeah. condition alan watts one of my favorite teachers in the world uh has this great quote where he says each of us is an aperture through which the universe observes itself only the game we're playing is to not know that so it's the ultimate game of hide and seek right so we learn to be victims why well then we can remember that we're creators so that's the rest of your question which is how do we unlearn victim thinking and, and one Thank of the you. easy Right. One of the easiest ways that I'm aware of, and I like easy, I, my favorite combo platter in life is simple, profound, simple, profound. So is to um, start to significantly heighten my awareness to my complaints and use every one of them as an opportunity to rewire my neural network so that I return to my natural state, which is to interpret and respond to all of life with awe, appreciation, enthusiasm, and creative genius. All in. So, so the practice, amen. So the practice is now, now I read somewhere, I cannot find this. I wish I could find the source, but who cares? I believe it to be true. Some study where scientists said that or concluded that as humans, we complain on average once every 11 seconds. <laughs> right so like 99.9 .9 of our complaints happen silently in our minds they're not even articulated into words like even even that yeah is, is me that is that is a sound a sound a tisp, the sound that we have learned to create an expression of a thought which is this sucks or I don't, i'm this is a problem i'm having a problem with reality that's my definition of a complaint so we have them so much more than we realize let's use every one as an opportunity to start turning it around, literally reprogramming the way that we're practicing responding to life. Byron Katie, another one of my favorite authors yeah. and teachers. My favorite quote of hers is, until you are able to respond to all of life with enthusiasm, your work's not done. So here's the practice. All Catch, here's the practice, three all steps. Life. Catch, own, upgrade. Catch yourself in complaint. Catch yourself feeling gun cool. Happens all damn day long. Right? When you're feeling, there's nothing inappropriate about it, but it's an opportunity to, we, we feel bad way more than any, we need to. Yeah. <laughs> I can actually make the argument that we never need to, but whatever. So catch yourself when you're feeling uncool slash in complaint, <clears throat> having a problem with what is. Own it. Own it. And this is how you own it. You literally, here's, I just, I'll just give the ownership sentence that you can use the ownership phrase because it's profound and it is the liberating is this. It's the key out of the prison of your mind of the victim thinking. I'm not feeling the way I'm feeling right now because of what's going on. I'm feeling this way because of how I'm interpreting it right now. And as Marcus Aurelius said, I, uh, I possess the, the right to revoke that at any moment, which then leads us to the final of the three steps, which is upgrade your qual the quality of your thinking in that moment. So let's just use a small example, like a, like a popular example, rather, uh, traffic. Traffic is something we've all learned to effortlessly complain about. <clears throat> what is traffic? Traffic is simply a collection of vehicles, people in cars going places, and they're congested for whatever you know, reasons. It's just congestion. So cars going slowly at the moment because they're all really close to each other, full of people who are going places. That's what traffic is. It's not a problem. It's just, that's just it. Right. <clears throat> so, but we've all learned to, to look at it as like a pain in the ass. So I'm in traffic. 
I get on the highway over here. I go on the, the 101, going up to Scottsdale, and I see it's backed all the way up right here on Chandler Boulevard. I'm like, you got to be kidding me right now. Instantaneously, not on purpose, but because I practiced it, because I have pra whatever I practice, I'll get great at. And I have practiced over the years having a real legitimate problem with traffic. So, so I'm so good at that. I'm so good at that, that I can get frustrated like that. I can just yep. see it. That's how good I am at that. Like that's mastery, but I'm mastering something that's not having me be amazing. So I catch that. Wow. I'm really frustrated. That's step one. Step two is I literally say to myself, and I want to say it out loud, loudly. I'm not feeling frustrated because of traffic. I'm feeling frustrated because I'm thinking about the traffic like a scrub, a rookie. Come on. And then the third step is upgrade. And, and, and you know, you can do anything. Stay with the subject matter. Don't change subjects. Well, at least, you know, we're going to see a nice movie and a dinner on Friday. That's so weak. Stay with the subject. Stay with your real circumstance and create from it. And say, so you could use, you can neutralize it with a, with a mantra. The neutralizer mantra ain't bad, just is. That's neutral. Or you could just go way higher than that, which I recommend, which is the problem is the gift. And then go, how? Well, actually, this is a great opportunity for me to enjoy Dan Patrick, listen to some sports. Or how about gratitude? Thank you. Thank you to, thank you to me for having created a life that has me own a car. When's the last time I thought about that yay to me for that that's amazing like i, I have a car and, right and thank you to all the people that built this car and thank you for all the people that toiled so hard to build these roads and just go up to gratitude and there you go that's a rep i have profoundly altered my state and i have practiced reprogramming the way i respond to reality so i'm getting closer to returning to the way we are before we're educated to see the world problematically which is where I respond to all of life with creation. Yeah, I, I love the frame, you know, the framing of, of gratitude around that. Uh, you know, you know, for me, anyway, gratitude, I mean, uh, Newton's uh, second law of thermodynamics. Um, yeah, every action has a, you know, an equal and opposite reaction uh, that kind of comes into play here. Gratitude moves me towards soul. I'm grateful for the creative source that has provided whatever it is that I'm you know, working with right now. Now, what's interesting mm -hmm. about that is the more that I put gratitude out, it, it's a force. It moves source back towards me. It keeps me connected to source in a very interesting way. The, the law of thermodynamics mm -hmm. actually is in play here. Yes, it is. So, you know, so gratitude and enthusiasm are two of the, I'm going to use interesting language on purpose. Mm -hmm. Gratitude and enthusiasm are two of the most intelligent emotional states that we could ever choose to think our way into. The word we've already talked about the gratitude, it activates all forms of intelligence, right? And it's so consistent with um, all human peak performance. The better we feel, the better we are, but only at everything and only always. So it's smart, yeah. it's nice, yeah. and it has yeah. to be amazing. Enthusiasm is a cool one because it actually is originally from the Greek word entheos, which means the creator within. Mm -hmm. So when I choose to think in ways that activate the state of enthusiasm, I'm activating all forms of creative genius. So not only does it feel good, but it has me be amazing. And that's how you keep yourself connected to the soul either the soul of your business or the soul of yourself, the soul of your relationship, the soul of your life. So folks, we've been talking to um, uh, Chris Doris here. Chris, you know, where can people find out more about what you're up to? Because I, I really want to encourage people to check out, you know, you've got a fascinating website. I mean, it's real easy to navigate and you've got a ton of resources up there. Yeah. Um, where can people find out more about what you're doing? Yeah. I appreciate that, Blaine. Uh, so my legacy, since I, I never had kids and I'm not going to at this point, my legacy will, is my content. So I really appreciate, like very much, I deeply appreciate your invitation to share that yeah, with people. So my website is <clears throat> ChristopherDoris.com. And one of the, in fact, the best creation I've ever made in my life, the best, as far as content goes, is the Daily Dose. And you referenced that earlier. It's the Daily Dose mental toughness tips in 30 seconds or less. That was a lot of effort. It's to like creating hundreds and hundreds 
of these taking mental toughness concepts, practices, disciplines, paradigm shifts, and then reducing them down into some rapidly consumable, meaningful nugget, right? And so when you sign up for that list, then every morning at around 6 a.m., wherever you are on the planet Earth, you will get your daily dose. That has just become my favorite project by far. I get messages from people in Sri Lanka and, and, and from you know, Russia, and they're saying, thank you. How did you know? It's like you wrote this one for me. It's just so beautiful. So, uh, and you can sign up. It's on my homepage, ChristopherDoris.com, right on the right-hand side. Or if you want to go to ChristopherDoris.com backslash lists, L-I-S-T-S, then you can get on, you'll get the daily dose. You also get my blogs on Tuesdays and then my uh, Tough Talks podcast interviews every other Thursday. So thank you for that. Uh, absolutely. Folks, take him up on the offer. Go to the site. Uh, sign up for the daily dose. I, yeah, I, I get it on a, on a, on a daily basis. <laughs> I'm dosing. Good. I'm dosing. So, yes. Chris, thank you for being such an incredibly erudite guest. I mean, I've loved this conversation. I could go on forever on this one. Um, and uh, we do have to go marlin fishing. There's no question about that. Amen, Please. brother. Amen. Long lunch and drink uh, drink a couple bottles of uh, nice beer. Uh, baby, <laughs> I'm down. Let's do it. Thanks, Folks, you've been listening to Soul of Business with Blaine Bartlett. Um, check out my website. I've got some stuff up there as well, uh, blainebartlett.com. And uh, if you've got any uh, questions about anything, um, the, there's a link on the, uh, on the website. You can contact me. Uh, we can uh, usually turn inquiries back around in about 24 hours at the most. So don't be shy. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. Thank you.